there's one more topic that we should familiarize ourselves with before we get into the calc forms that we're going to use to uh, come up with our firing solutions. Now, when you're laying down and you're calculating all these different things to determine what your bullet uh, drop is going to be so that you can index the correct elevation values on your scope and figure out what your uh, windage is going to be and things like that, you have to have a pretty intimate understanding of how these different values are derived mathematically so that if goofy things happen in the field, you can correct them a lot more efficiently if you actually understand what's going on. And there are some things that you're going to want to be aware of before we get into our uh, calc forms. A lot of guys ask the question, what's the difference between the G1 and the G7 drag functions? And uh, that's, that's the big question we're going to answer here today. But before we answer that, we're going to have to just go over ballistic coefficients in a kind of a review format real quick. And then we'll get into the math behind these different uh, drag coefficients and ballistic coefficients. So the first thing we need to uh, review here is ballistic coefficients. Now, by now, you should probably have a pretty good idea of what a ballistic coefficient is generally or practically speaking. By now, you should know that uh, we, we selected bullets with the highest ballistic coefficient values that we could when we did our projectile selection. That was one of the main criteria we looked at. And you should know by now that uh, the higher the ballistic coefficient value is, the better that bullet's going to retain its velocity at distance, and it's going to hold its energy uh, a lot longer, and it's going to cut through the wind better. It's going to be more aerodynamically efficient flying through the atmosphere. It's more streamlined. So higher ballistic coefficient is desirable for our long-range precision shooting applications. So what exactly is a ballistic coefficient, and how do we... Uh, mathematically get that value well simply put before we get into the formula a ballistic coefficient is just a ratio it's the ratio of velocity retardation due to air drag for a particular bullet that you're looking at against that of a larger g model standard reference projectile so it's the ratio it's uh, how the bullet you're looking at is going to perform next to the standard reference projectile, okay? And uh, that's where this G1 and G7 uh, language comes into play. Those are referring to reference projectiles and the Drake functions that were derived from them. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second here, so hang with me. It's a little, little confusing to try to explain, uh, but we'll get through this. If we look at the formula... This is from the Hornady reloading manual, if I remember correctly. To determine a ballistic coefficient, uh, we have C equals the ballistic coefficient. And if you want to figure that out, you simply take the mass of the bullet in pounds. Okay. Now, uh, if you have a 180 grain bullet, the, the grain is a weight measurement. You probably know this already, but there are 7,000 grains per one pound in weight. So grains are uh, a weight measurement. It's not, a lot of guys get confused. They think that grains are like the individual, individual grains of powder. And uh, when you're weighing out a powder charge when you're reloading, it's true that you do uh, measure out your powder in grains, but that's a weight measurement of the powder. If you have 43.1 grains of powder, you don't have 43 little flakes. You have 43.1 grains in weight, and it's 7,000 grains per pound. So you can figure that out. So you take the mass of your bullets in pounds, and bullets are also uh, measured in grains as well. You take that mass, and you multiply it by the form factor. Okay, The form factor, factor is basically determined from a test projectile of the same shape, which we're going to get into in a minute here, uh, test projectiles. And you take that times the, the bullet diameter in inches. So if you have a 7-millimeter bullet, that's a 284 caliber. So that's 0.284 inches. So it's a pretty simple formula. Well, uh, the only thing in this formula that's a little goofy that we don't understand is the form factor uh, represented by I here in the formula. What's the form factor talking about? Okay, well, a form factor is just a multiplier which relates the shape of a bullet to the shape of the standard projectile that we're using to prepare a particular ballistic table. So mathematically speaking, the form factor, or also known as a coefficient of retardation, that's how fast your bullet's going to uh, slow down, that equals the coefficient of drag of any bullet you're looking at divided by the coefficient of drag of the defined G function standard bullet. 
So what are we talking about the standard bullet all the time here? What is that anyways? Well, the standard projectile or the standard reference projectile was something that they had to invent so that they could start to compare different bullet designs against each other and start to mathematically determine drag functions for how uh, different projectiles are going to act when they're going through different atmosphere regimes, okay? Uh, you know, air density does change with altitude and with uh, meteorological conditions and humidity and uh, temperature and all these different things. So there's a lot of variables there. The, the drag factors on, uh, on a bullet are going to obviously change when you have the bullet shape or the weight or the diameter or the, the how sharp the nose is, what kind of a tail on the bullet you have. All these different fluid dynamics things are going on. And uh, mathematically trying to predict what's going to happen when you launch a projectile into such fast motion. You're talking about supersonic velocities in most cases, sometimes double or triple sonic going three times, two times the speed of sound. That's very, very fast. And so the atmosphere at those speeds becomes very, very thick. It's not like waving your hand through the air where you can barely feel it. I mean, it's like a, air is a solid object almost at those speeds. So uh, drag effects are huge when we're talking about ballistics, exterior ballistics. So in order to mathematically uh, come up with these formulas and particularly the uh, coefficient of drag and the drag functions, they had to use test projectiles. And what they did is they just uh, built a standard reference projectile, which would be kind of similar to in shape to that which uh, the other projectiles you'd be testing. And you would extensively test that projectile in the real world. You'd gather observational data of exactly how that projectile acted under the, the conditions that you were testing it. And then based on that observational data, you could come up with drag functions. Now, what's a function? What do we mean by that? You know what drag is, okay? A function, if you remember in our uh, mathematics class, is, is a relationship between a set of inputs and a set of permissible outputs with the property that each input is related to exactly one output. So uh, it's like a machine if you want to figure out how, how something's going to happen. And uh, you, you, it's a mathematical expression, and then it'll spit out the answer for you. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking functions. That's just a mathematical term of what we're talking about. But in order to develop these different drag functions, they had to use these uh, reference projectiles, okay? And depending on which shape bullet and uh, what the contours are on the bullet you're going to be using, uh, there's different reference projectiles that these different functions were uh, based upon. So the function, the drag function that you're going to be using you're going to want to match to the reference projectile that is most similar to the bullet you're using so that you come up with the best results. If you develop a drag function, which is a mathematical expression of how much drag an object has, let's say you develop a drag function for a stuffed animal that you're going to launch out of a cannon, okay? And you want to see how that's going to, you know, cut through the wind and how, how, what your velocity re retardation is going to be for a stuffed animal, okay? You're going to have a radically different drag function on a stuffed animal than you are with a cannonball. And you're going to have a different uh, function for a cannonball than you would for a modern uh, boat tail spar point rifle bullet, right? Because all those things are going to act different flying through the atmosphere, obviously. So um, you're going to have different drag functions for different reference projectiles, okay? So uh, that's uh, as simple as I can put it right there. But uh, let's get into this in a little more depth here. Let's look at the coefficient of drag just real quick again. The, the coefficient of drag is pretty simple. It's an aerodynamic factor that relates air drag to air density. It also takes into effect the cross-sectional area of the bullet, the, the velocity, and the mass of the bullet. So it's kind of just a generic indicator of the drag for any bullet of that same general shape profile, okay? So when we're talking about a coefficient of drag, it's just a generic indicator of drag on that shape of a bullet. So for if you change bullet designs, you're going to have a different um, coefficient of drag, obviously. So let's go through the history here, and uh, now let's talk a little bit more about the different drag functions. Now, there's a, a whole lot of different drag functions that were developed over time, but there are two that we're going to uh, concern ourselves with. Because there are, in, in modern rifle bullets, there are basically two that you're going to see, G1 and G7. 
back in the 1800s. Uh, they started to get into modern ballistics, you know, artillery ballistics. There was a, a demand for that for military applications because they wanted to get more precise with their artillery fire. And in the 1870s, uh, there was a projectile developed for the use of determining these different uh, math problems like we're talking about. And they invented the Krupp projectile is what it's called. So you're going to hear that. And it was developed, and this is after uh, the Civil War, before World War One, the 1870s when he had John Wayne, you know, acting in all the cowboy movies. Well, act, no, you know, he was pretending to be a cowboy from the 1870s, but that era, horse and buggy days, you know. And uh, they developed a standard reference projectile to determine the ballistic coefficients for bullets of that time, okay? And this was mostly for artillery purposes, and it was also used for just modern uh, exterior ballistics on uh, small arms as well. Because the, uh, and here's a picture of the crew projectile. You can see it's got a flat base to it in the back, and it's got a, uh, it's got that old school shape. Not quite a maxi ball like they're using in the muskets. They're starting to get into the cartridge guns. But if you look at the old antique rifles, the 45 110s, 45 70s, uh, a lot of them are going to have bullet profiles of this shape. So this was developed for the projectiles of the time. And the exact dimensions of this Krupp projectile were it was a one-inch diameter, okay, so a one-caliber uh, bullet. That was the diameter. It was three calibers long. That's three inches long, okay. And it had an ogival head. And an ogive is that curve shape, okay, uh, that's that's referred to as the ogive, and the the ogival head was uh, it had a two caliber radius. So if you would use a compass to draw a radius to to uh, basically draw out the curve on that ogive, it would be two caliber radius. So that's what that means. Just so you don't get confused by the language. And this was the Krupp projectile, and this was what was used to uh, uh, really get into a lot of the early external ballistics. And some of uh, the work of these famous ballistic expert guys from back in the day, Ingalls and Mayevsky and some of these guys, they refined a lot of this math and really developed the, the foundation for small arms exterior ballistics, uh, especially as used by our uh, modern shooting sports industry today. So this original crew projectile was... Uh, kind of redefined and reworked and uh, these guys worked on it a little bit and what was developed was the standard G1 pro projectile and it was very very similar to the crew projectile it was pretty much the same thing it was just a tad bit longer about a quarter inch longer and uh, it was a little more closely matching the proportions of the modern artillery shells of the time when they re refined it but the, they developed the G1 off the crew projectile and uh, this is when bullet manufacturers started to uh, advertise their bullets and they wanted to uh, give you ballistic coefficients so you could use that for comparison purposes. So you can compare it to the competitor's bullets or other bullets that they were uh, offering, you know. So um, they started to publish all their ballistic coefficients using the G1 reference projectile. And, and the ballistic coefficients were all derived from that uh, reference projectile. If you remember earlier, we said that a ballistic coefficient is simply derived by comparing the bullet you're looking at against, it's the ratio of the, the retardation of uh, velocity on that bullet to the reference projectile. In this case, it was this one, okay? Now, as uh, modern bullets started, you know, being redesigned further and further, and the, the uh, ogival head started getting more elongated, it was uh, a more streamlined bullets, and especially when you get into the VLD, the very low drag profile bullets with the bow tails like we're going to be using. This Krupp projectile, and the G1 uh, standard projectile, I should call it rather, uh, the refined Krupp, was uh, starting to become more and more inappropriate for um, uh, developing the ballistic coefficients. Because just like we said earlier, if you're using a stuffed animal <laughs> shot out of a cannon, as your reference projectile for a cannonball, the math is going to be wrong. And the curve that is drawn out, the, the drag coefficient, because the drag coefficient is going to be dependent on velocity, as we mentioned earlier in the formula. So as your velocity regimes change, your uh, drag coefficient values are going to be diverse for different projectiles. So a stuffed animal's uh, drag coefficient curve is going to look drastically different than something else. So unfortunately, as bullets uh, 
got more and more refined and, and started to stray from this original shape of the reference projectile, the drag coefficient was more and more off. So what happened was the ballistic coefficients weren't accurate. So they were still using the same math, but they had the wrong reference projectile, something that was inappropriate. Now, there were other reference projectiles being made during this time. Uh, they made G5 reference projectiles. They made the G7, and they, they came up with all these new uh, drag functions based on new reference projectiles. But the reason the sports industry, I think, probably stuck with the original G1 is because people had gotten used to it. They didn't want to confuse the customer, so it was probably an administrative decision, not a scientific decision. If it was purely scientific, uh, they would have redefined their ballistic coefficients based on the new math, the new uh, drag functions, okay? And they would have started giving you bullets in different, uh, you know, ballistic coefficients and drag functions, okay? But they didn't because they didn't want to, it was an administrative advertising type decision. Also, some of the other... Uh, when we're talking about very low drag profile bullets, like we're using for long distance shooting, the G7 drag function is basically built on a reference projectile, which is very similar in shape to our modern boat tail spar point bullet designs. So actually the G7 function is, is a, a lot better choice for the bullets that we're using. However, when you work out the math, the value that is given to you is lower than the G1 uh, ballistic coefficient that would be provided for that same bullet so you can look at that uh box of burger bullets and it has both the g1 and the g7 ballistic coefficients provided which one looks better right the g1 has a higher value so psychologically it seems like it should be better so they didn't want to kind of work against their advertising campaign and start advertising their ballistic coefficients in g7 because people aren't mathematicians they're not going to understand what they're talking about as far as drag functions they're going to want to pick the bullet when they're buying them with the higher number even though they don't understand that it's just a, a different drag function it's a different math problem being used to give you a more accurate assessment of that bullets uh, aerodynamic character okay so that's kind of the reason why they stuck with the G1 drag function for so long. And today, when you open up a reloading manual or when you're purchasing bullets, 99, well, 90% of the time or more, they're going to be advertised in the G1 function. And if it's not labeled as G7, it's pretty much going to be G1 if you're buying sporting bullets over the counter. So how did they deal with this? How did they uh, fix this? How did they get it to work? Why do we use this for our long-range precision shooting. Well, from our last few videos, we're talking about spin drift, Coriolis drift, and uh, determining these. I started introducing you to uh, Mecca Streisand's tables uh, that he developed on Excel sheets based on some of the stuff we we're talking about here. He's a participant in the Sniper 101 project, and uh, he, he developed it using G1. And when I went through the JBM ballistics uh, software that we're using, I actually showed you guys how to determine your bullet drops using the G1 drag function. Now, why would a guy go ahead and do that? That's crazy, right? If we just said their G7 might actually give you uh, better results mathematically. And the reason for that is they actually readjusted those values. So uh, they were corrected is how they did that. And they would basically average out the performance over a long shot. They would look at what was actually seen empirically and then mathematically derive a corrected ballistic coefficient for that G1 value. And that's why they still do work pretty good. But there are some problems you need, need to be aware of. And uh, the G7 actually would be a better choice mathematically speaking. But the main reason why we are showing you how to do the G1 is because all the bullets that you're going to be using when you get started with this are going to be provided with the G1. Some of them are in G7. If it does provide the G7, then I would recommend going through JBM Ballistics and plug it in, in to the G7 table because the reference projectile for a G7 uh, drag function is going to be a lot more representative of your VLD-style bullets that you're using for this shooting application. Now, if you're shooting a 45 120 Sharps and you're using a bullet that's shaped more like the G1, uh, then go ahead and use that. Or if you know if you know what you're doing with the other reference projectiles and drag functions, if you determine one of those other drag functions is more appropriate, by all means, plug that into your ballistic software because that's the best way to go. But for all practical purposes, we're in a G1 world, commercially speaking, so I wanted to n not neglect to show you how to make it work.
Um, I have made it work, and you will have to adjust for some things. Now, here's the problem that, that happens. Um, one of the, the neat things Sierra did, for example, uh, I use the 300 grain match kings a lot for my uh, 338 uh, Lapua Magnum. And uh, they, they found out that they had to correct for these different uh, problems that they were seeing in the G1 drag function because the ballistic coefficient G1 for the three, 300 grain match king varies with velocity. And it's like uh, 0.6, or I'm, I'm sorry, 0.768 at a certain velocity regime, and then as it uh, changes, as the bullet decelerates, the uh, ballistic coefficient actually changes. So it's going to give you different BC values for different velocities. And JBM Ballistics is actually set up to adjust for that. And uh, so it can give you a lot more accurate results rather than just uh, averaging out the overall performance, okay? But you still have some small differences that you're going to notice. And what happens is, even though Sierra did give you the different BC values, what happens is these uh, ballistics programs are going to have abrupt changes in the numbers because it's mathematically telling it to go through the G1 drag function with this corrected value for this velocity regime, and then it abruptly shifts gears into a new ballistic coefficient that's recalculated for a different velocity window, and then it shifts gears a third time in some cases, and uh, every time you give a new ballistic coefficient value for a certain velocity range, you're going to have an abrupt shifting in the uh, drag coefficient. And that's not going to represent the reality of the actual drag curve, obviously. So in the drop data, you may see very tiny variations. And sometimes they're, uh, they're a little bigger, too. It depends on this is mostly on the bullet manufacturer's ability to uh, test these projectiles and give you the best ballistic coefficient value that's corrected for their use of the G1 drag function. So that's kind of what's going on there. It's kind of a nightmare, ballistically speaking, and that's why some of these um, ballistic programs seem kind of complicated is because they're trying to correct for something. They're, they're using uh, an imperfect equation to give you as close results as they can and uh, still you know, working with the data that the bullet manufacturers provide with their new projectiles. All that being said, there are ways to actually determine uh, your actual ballistic coefficient value averages for your bullet. And a lot of guys ask this question too, because um, basically a good ballistic program should be able to uh, use two different velocities and the distance between them to calculate an exact ballistic coefficient for any of these drag models. However, this is taking in an average over a big distance. So even though you can kind of reverse engineer a correct ballistic coefficient for like if you're figuring it out for exactly 1,000 yards or whatever, you change that to 800 and it's going to average it out for a different part of that window. So it's never going to be, it's not like a linear deal like we talked about before with some of our other topics. Because anytime you're working with something that's based on the wrong foundation on the math, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be imperfect. Garb garbage in, garbage out is the saying. So um, the best way to do this is to try to determine your ballistic coefficient for the correct drag function that's going to most accurately re represent the bullet you're using. So you'd have to uh, take chronograph readings at long range to accomplish this, but if you're into this, there's guys who can show you how to do this. It's not that hard. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go through it on this series, if you're that much into the ballistics field, you should have no problem figuring that out. It's quite simple. But uh, you can determine the G7 drag function, your bullet, just by uh, taking two different velocity readings at different distances between them. So in a perfect world, you're going to want to match your bullet to the drag function for the most appropriate reference projectile that you, uh, that you have at your disposal. So to summarize here, just to go over again, uh, to put this in different words, most bullet manufacturers do properly measure the velocity erosion of their bullets, and then they publish that ballistic coefficient, even though it's in the G1, using an average of the calculated G1 for uh, normal velocities. So the main limitations of the G1 are that the ballistic coefficients are based on a single drag function, and they can't be correct for all the velocities 
of that uh, bullet that it's going to go through, especially when we're talking about long range. You're not talking about point blank velocities. Your muzzle velocity is going to change. It's going to constantly be decreasing the entire time it's flying, and it's going to start off going pretty fast. You might start off at 3,000 feet a second, and at 1,000, you might be at 1,000 feet a second. So that's a lot of change there that you can't really account for um, when they just take a solid average. So the superior way to do it is the way Sierra did it if you're going to be working with the G1 drag functions. Okay. Uh, another limitation to the G1 is obviously that the change to air drag as a function of velocity does not happen abruptly, like we said before. So even though you can correct for it, kind of like Sierra did, by changing the BC values, in reality, that's not an abrupt change, so it's not truly representative of its character. Um, another limitation is that the drag changes are continuous. So in other words, these drag changes are continuous and not abrupt. That's very important to realize. That's the main limitation to these uh, corrected uh, BCs for these G1 limitations. And, uh, you know, some points along the trajectory are, are not going to co correspond to the real world. Now, that depends on where these abrupt changes are located. If... Uh, it, and if you plot this out, you can kind of see it, but uh, usually it's going to be very, very, very close. I mean, so close that you're not even going to be able to adjust for it like uh, another click. So it's going to be uh, well within your uh, precision parameters to still make a hit on a target. So you can make the G1 drag functions work just fine for real world applications. Now, if you're shooting extremely tiny targets at extreme long ranges, that may warrant further development of your ballistic tables where you will confirm your actual drop at ranges and we're going to talk about that more as we get into the series in more depth these ballistic tables that we're uh building for you at first here all based on mathematics are really only a starting point and you will be adjusting these things down the road based on your observational data because the bullet is going to be going exactly where it wants to go if the bullet hit someplace you weren't expecting it, then that was uh, something wrong with the math or something wrong with one of the inputs that we did in the math, okay? So uh, we will be confirming uh, the performance of these projectiles, and the more we shoot and the more data we gather, the more accurate we're going to get. And even the G7 drag functions, as good as they are for these applications, we're probably going to be adjusting those because in the real world there are things that are hard to adjust for. Like we talked about earlier, you know, the way... The rifling carves uh, grooves on the side of the projectile can decelerate the rotational velocity. That can uh, put a yaw on the bullet sooner than expected, which can, can cause the drag to change. You know, you have these dynamic instabilities being produced in different ways, uh, in different atmosphere uh, densities, uh, different rifling styles. There's infinite different complications that come into play here that are all going to make your particular load, your exact bullet, and your rifle and, and the bore in your rifle and the way you shoot and everything's going to come into play and you are going to have unique uh, firing solutions for your rifle and load combo in your uh, shooting area. So you are going to have to confirm these things and adjust them slightly in the real world. But uh, so this is a good starting point. And another thing to consider with all this too, uh, I can understand the frustration with uh, the math being imperfect, but you've got to consider the fact that Exterior ballistics is, is kind of a new science. It is getting more and more mature every day. There's a lot of research that goes into it. Um, pretty much every military in the world is working hard at it for over 150 years now trying to figure out these things. They have done extensive Doppler radar measurements. They've uh, had numerous research teams working on the fluid dynamics, the drag coefficients, uh, figuring out these different dimensionless uh, quantities. Uh, and mathematically expressing them in different ways and really trying to model and predict how these projectiles are going to fly. Uh, and just due to the innumerable different variations, you can hardly ever get laboratory conditions in real life out in the field because your atmosphere is something that is never constant. Even when you're talking about internal ballistics, with each bullet going down, each bore is going to have its own uh, properties and the way it's going to act. So... Even though it would be nice to be able to just uh, type in all these things into your ballistic computer and come up with an exact firing solution that's going to be correct every time, um, 
if someone could figure out how to do that, that'd be excellent. And that's kind of the goal of what we're working on as far as trying to get it better and better and closer and closer. And uh, nowadays, they actually have it very close. And like I talked about before, if you do uh, go through all the trouble of verifying every last one of your inputs, doing everything you possibly can to ensure that your uh, inter internal ballistics are 100% consistent, that's including your rifle and ammunition system and your optics, and uh, you account for all these different uh, ballistic factors, you're going to get very, very close. We have gotten most of the wiggle room out of it, uh, but there's still, I mean, there's still long ways to go. There's just all kinds of things that can pop up. So, but the best we can do, I would recommend if you do have your bullet, if you have the choice between G1 and G7 ballistic coefficients, if your, if your bullets are advertised in the G7, go ahead and try that out. Make sure that we do that. You specify that when you type in that ballistic coefficient that it is in the G7 or the G1, because if you, if you mix and match, it's going to give you crazy numbers. So if you're typing in a G7 ballistic coefficient, make sure you click the G7 box on the ballistic program to, to spit out the right numbers because those coefficients are matched to those drag functions, different math problem. So hopefully uh, I didn't convolute the subject too bad. It is kind of complicated. It's a little bit hard to explain. But uh, that's the main difference between G1 and G7 drag functions. They're just based on different reference projectiles. If you want to take one thing home from this video, that's to match your ballistic coefficient that you're going to choose to use with the uh, drag function that is most representative of the bullet style you're shooting. All right, let's get out of here.